Hello, hello, hello. So uh, today is uh, week 71 in Intuitive Momentum Fitness. And I uh, appreciate you guys being here and being on the journey of health and healing and recovery uh, with me. So uh, today we're talking about kind of witnessing each other when we feel unseen. So um, I think that's a, it's a common uh, feeling that we have as empaths and trauma survivors to be unseen, to feel unseen, to feel unheard. And so we want to take this time um, and use this space to see each other and hear each other. So, um, if you weren't able to comment on the previous post from yesterday morning, then um, hopefully you can just find this encouraging and know that you are not alone in these feelings. And I, I think that everyone that commented, commented on things that, um, are fairly universal among us uh, in this group and people in general who feel um, who are empathic and have experienced trauma and are the ones who do the seeing and remain invisible and do the hearing and remain unheard. So I um, want to encourage us with that today, but uh, first a little uh, I always try to think of something that I can share in my own journey that is encouraging and um, is an update for you <clears throat> so that you know that I'm I'm with you <laughs> on on a journey and in the process so um, a couple months ago I think now I commented that I had lost track of my food tracking for a little bit because uh, I was like listening to all these health experts talking about the benefits of good fat and the importance of having that in your diet and all that. It's like, yeah, I probably should increase the fat. And I didn't even check <laughs> um, how much fat I was getting yet. I um, I just went straight to you know I'm just gonna add some some butter to my meals and um, uh, for a while I was doing MCT oil and then got, kind of got away from that but um, but yeah I was adding uh, s some butter it seemed like there was something else but I was making sure there was fat in the diet and there was like way more than enough fat <laughs> and so I I went from um, being lean to adding some inches in my waist and I was like noticing that I was getting a little thicker and I was like wait a minute what's going on so I I at that point after a couple months of this I checked <laughs> my macros and uh, found that I was eating almost twice the amount of fat that I needed and um, so uh, that was uh, obviously a little frustrating and then, you know, just kind of ridiculous and um, and uh, kind of annoyed with myself for, you know, just kind of not paying attention to what I was doing and, you know, looking at a piece of the picture instead of the whole picture. And a piece of the picture is that fat is good for you. The whole picture is that I was getting plenty of fat and I didn't need to add any more uh you know, anything additional to what was already coming with my protein. So, um, I modified that and so I've been leaning down again and so that's been good. Um, but then at the beginning of June, right after I finished the book and I, you know, it doesn't seem surprising to me that this happened all at the same time, but I finished the book and I uh, was sharing about my coaching offerings and then I got sick and I was 
kind of down <laughs> for four solid days where I really just couldn't do anything. Um, I caught up on some Disney Plus shows. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, so then I, I was um, starting to feel a little better and and all that, but I noticed that while I was sick, I lost some weight. And I was like hoping to lose some weight anyway, but then it didn't seem like it was from my waist. So I was like, oh, that's, that's not good. I don't want to lose muscle. And then, um, and then after I was sick, I kept losing weight. So it was like a total of eight pounds. Uh, it was like four or five pounds when I was sick and then uh, another three or four pounds after. And, um, and so I've been keeping an eye on that and like, what's, what's going on there? I'm, I'm, I've got some pretty hard workouts in since I was sick and I've been eating enough to where I should be coming back up to a certain weight. And I haven't been so far, but the reason I'm not too anxious about that is I also feel like I've been cleansing for a while because my I've been dialing in my nutrition to uh, exactly what seems to work best for my body and so I've been doing that and continuing to um, be consistent with that and um, and I can tell by um, by my stool and and um, other indicators that I, I've been in cleansing mode possibly until two days ago. So, um, yeah, I'm just going to keep an eye on my weight and see how it goes. I'm going to stay consistent with my uh, nutrition intake that's pretty dialed in and then still do the heavy strength training uh, drop set routine that I've been working on and getting back to the last couple of weeks. So I'm um, going to see if my weight will come back up and um, and if I can tell visibly uh, that my uh, muscle is getting back into more of the shape that I want it to be in. So that's my uh, current fitness update and uh, and I'll keep you posted. So today we're talking about feeling unseen, um, unheard, unwitnessed and so I shared this quote from Amanda Flaker. She has been my uh, spiritual mentor for uh, six years, almost seven years. So here's this quote from her. The core of trauma is feeling unseen, unheard, unwitnessed. It is essentially feeling alone, feeling separate. If you continue to hide away the places where you feel unseen, unheard, unwitnessed, you are looped into the collective psychic bullying that says only these emotions are acceptable. You are suppressing how you actually feel. Emotions are not wrong, they're just messengers. Move towards how you feel and expand it for the purpose of witness and release. I think that's so beautiful <clears throat> because that's really, really true. The core of trauma is feeling unseen, unheard, unwitnessed. Because when someone is there to witness you and to acknowledge that the way you feel is something that they value and appreciate and they can like confirm that that makes sense that you would feel that way, then it's such a relief. It allows us to know that we're not crazy. It allows us to uh, kind of feel held in that moment, in that feeling and And so not feeling seen or heard or witnessed is so traumatic. 
it really is the um, the aspect that that causes us uh, continuous pain because we were experiencing pain and hurt in that moment, but also like not being seen in that, not being witnessed, not being heard in that pain. And so the last two sentences that she shares, emotions are not wrong, they're just messengers. So how you feel is not wrong. Feeling sad or angry or disappointed or jealous or envious, like those are not wrong feelings. They are messengers and they let us know there's something more to be looked at. So she says, move toward how you feel. And I believe that's primarily for the purpose of understanding and witnessing yourself. Um, and she says, move toward how you feel and expand it for the purpose of witness and release. One of the things that I heard, I think it was in, let's see, I think it was in Complex PTSD by Pete Walker. I could be wrong, I'm trying to remember now. But he gave the example of someone being in a car accident and someone who is held by a friend or even a stranger, just held in a hug immediately after a car accident is less likely to develop PTSD from the car accident. Someone who is not held and is just interrogated as to what happened and, you know, asked for the details of the wreck and all that stuff is more likely to develop PTSD after that incident. So just being witnessed, and I think that's what holding is. People talk about holding space, and I think that's what that is. Like, if you're in an accident and someone, even a stranger, comes up and gives you a hug, and they're holding you, that's they're witnessing what you've experienced. They're witnessing that moment with you. And that's a powerful thing. It's a very healing thing. And as we go through the comments and, and we talk specifically about the different ways that you all feel unseen, unheard, unwitnessed, that, that coming back into our body, being held, witnessing is the key. So we're going to talk about some things at the end, but, um, but just this exercise is part of the healing process because we're all witnessing with each other everything that we're talking about. So we're holding each other. We're holding space for each other. So that's coming back into the body is the thing that seems to be healing. Bessel van der Kolk, who wrote The Body Keeps the Score, is the world's leading expert on PTSD, and he said he's never seen anything more effective than yoga. And I believe that the, the, the essence of that is that yoga helps people get back in their body, helps them get connected with their breath, helps them connect with their strength and their bone and sinew and muscle. It reminds them that they are living in a very powerful, resilient human body. And that's a beautiful thing. So, um, so yeah, we're gonna uh, go through the comments and I'll have little comments here and there and, and then wrap up at the end. But Leanne says, I've never really been comfortable with expressing anger. I push it down. Often it was because I was a person, I was with a person expressing rage, punching walls, breaking things. It would have been dangerous to express my own rage for their behavior. 
Now I have separated myself from those people and situations, but I still don't know how to properly express those feelings. I often become disassociative when the, the feelings emerge. So Leanne, thank you for sharing that. I know that's something we can all relate to. When you're in a power dynamic, then, you know, in a situation where everyone's expressing rage, it kind of becomes a competition. It becomes like you, you, you end up at war with each other. Like if you're trying to shut down the person who is raging and, you know, using your rage to shut down their rage, then it's like wh whoever is the strongest is going to win and going to destroy the other person. So obviously that's not a brilliant plan for your safety or for their well-being. And so, yeah, there was wisdom in those moments in survival mode to um, halt your, your anger, but that leaves you unwitnessed. So it's possible they're feeling anger because they're unwitnessed, but it's most likely in those types of situations, not something that's happening in the moment, something happened a long time ago. And so they're expressing their anger in a destructive way about things that they've never, they've never gone back to witness. Anger is usually a sign or uh, a messenger that your boundaries have been violated. And someone has committed an offense against you in some way. And so when you are empathic and you grow up with uh, narcissistic people or abusive people, then you learn to stay invisible to stay under the radar and um, and you witness how damaging rage can be so I know for myself I've been terrified of my own anger because I know how destructive it can be and if you've bottled it up over and over and over and over again then at some point it is going to come out in an extreme uh, and violent and, you know, probably really inappropriate way because it, it wasn't scaled to the event. It was building up for a long time. So, yeah, the crazy thing is, and I've been practicing this, is, is realizing that it's okay to feel anger. And feeling anger doesn't mean I have to do something about it right then in order to have integrity. I can feel anger and witness it. I don't have to instantly respond to it. I don't have to act on it. But it's okay to feel it and it's okay to witness it. So, um, so that may be the, the beginning baby step for those of us who are unfamiliar with our own anger because we've not allowed it to process, to emerge, to be seen. So uh, witnessing ourselves is really powerful, so important. So, um, so yeah, we witness you, Leanne. Uh, we see you, we hear you and uh, we can relate. So if anyone has any thoughts about anger um, as you watch this uh, now or after, um, yeah, I'd love to hear it. I'm sure it'd be encouraging. So then uh, Susie says, I'm often challenged with negative emotions, including upset, irritation, and even boredom. I'm often trying to figure out how to sit with them and process them 
or even just feel entitled to have those feelings. That comes from having key people in my life hushing me in some manner, changing the subject, directing me not to make a fuss, and generally doing things to avoid listening to me. I am aware that these key people may maybe don't know what to do with or how to express those feelings themselves. They maybe felt they had to suppress them for their own survival. I have over the years learned to make a fuss or speak up for myself, but I still feel guilty or weird when I have negative emotions because those key people's reaction led me to believe my feelings were wrong or invalid. And then I can go into thinking, I must be extraordinarily negative. <laughs> and who would want to listen to me or be around me or deep, really deeply get to know me? Cue more negative thoughts and it's a, a kind of feedback loop. Yep, totally relate to that. This loop does get broken down when I find someone who will listen. And on some logical level, I realize I'm not as much of a freak as I think I am, but it's hard to break out of that mindset where I got habituated to thinking that there's something wrong with me for feeling upset, no matter how big or small. So an addendum that I thought of later in terms of health outcomes is that how I came to deal with feelings of boredom in particular is to soothe with food especially in situations where I don't have freedom to address the boredom with other things. For example, I can't exactly tinker on a craft project when I'm feeling bored at work. So, um, yeah, that's a great observation. Um, and I think authenticity with feelings is so important because feelings are like the weather. So it's not a permanent state of things. It can't, like, it can't, some, sometimes people just have really a negative approach to life in general. And, you know, um, if you're in the service industry, then you, you know these kinds of people because you can, you can tell when they come in. They're not just having a bad day or a bad moment. Um, they're not happy unless they're miserable unless there's something tragic happening or or someone wronged them or um or they can you know prove the evil of the world uh with some tangible just happened fact or something and and I know that's not you Susie uh so so being able, being, feeling free to process these emotions, you know, whether they're negative or not is so important. And I think that's, that's where, you know, when you're a kid and you're not allowed to do any kind of processing with your emotions as a kid, because you have to always be uh, smiling and catering to the big people and their emotions. And uh, you're supposed to be unseen and unheard. <laughs> Um, that's like intentional trauma, unintentional, intentional trauma. And so that, that's super, super challenging to undo because the people that meant the most to you, that had the most influence over you in your life when you were the most vulnerable and at the point of like learning everything, they trained us to to hide to not share and and we were called negative when we were hurt by something or complained about something and that isn't necessarily what was actually happening so um so yeah so then allowing ourselves now to feel the way we feel and to not try to fix it, but to actually witness it and have compassion and grace for it is, um, is challenging, but so key to our well-being and our health. So 
Um, yeah, so great examples, Susie. Uh, we witness you in that, even with, you know, you know, the example of being at work and being bored. And so instead of, you know, being able to grab a craft project, <laughs> which might seem strange in the workplace, um, it's easier to grab some food and, and that makes sense. And so, you know, our senses, including taste buds and smell are very powerful. And so then we create these patterns, uh, basically of chemical addiction, uh, that are associated with certain feelings and certain times of the day. So then it's easier to get stuck in a routine of this when you don't necessarily uh, want that on a conscious level. Uh, but it's when you're um, responding unconsciously that these things get away from us. So yeah, great thoughts, great example. Uh, again, we witness you, Susie. And um, yeah, thank you for sharing. Let me grab some water. So I am trying to honor my body when my body lets me know, Hey, I could use some water. I'm trying to, you know, get some water right then. Um, when I need to get up out of the chair or off the couch, when I'm working on stuff on my laptop and move around for a little bit, I am intending to respond to that not just, you know, finish another thing, but actually get up and move around. Uh, so that I can <clears throat> practice listening to my body and honoring what its requests are, what its preferences are. So Danielle says, I'm uncomfortable expressing how much I'm hurt. Sometimes I just want to cry out. No one likes to hear about discomfort, so I keep it to myself, feeling so lonely as a result. And man, that is, that's that's really painful. And, um, and I, I witness that I honor that. And, uh, there have been times for myself in the last week, week and a half where I have felt that way. And I wanted to cry out or cry and be witnessed in that. But, um, you know, it's, it's hard to think of who might be able to handle that, let alone who has, free time for that. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I feel like ideally as a uh, human species, we are, we are tribe people, but when the tribes that we belong to are really unhealthy, then it's, it kind of really unrealistic to, to try to be visible with some of these things. So, um, so hopefully we are as individuals creating new tribes, healthier families to belong to. And, and building a group of people that can witness us and hear us and see us. So I believe that this group is a really beautiful place for that. So I would love to invite you all when you are feeling lonely or angry or need to process some things, you know, sometimes it may be appropriate to uh, obscure the nitty gritty details, but you're always welcome to share how you're feeling, uh, with this group. So I hope that you do feel comfortable with that, that you do, uh, trust that enough. Uh, there've been a lot of really beautiful memes shared and, um, and I, I love that this space is safe for that. Cause maybe you don't feel like you can just share that in general. Um, and so to step even beyond that, 
um, I want to invite you that this, this space is safe for vulnerability. So um, I really appreciate you being here and uh, all of that. So thank you for sharing, Daniel. Um, big hugs to you. Uh, you. You are witnessed, seen, and heard. Uh, Janelle says, I have trouble expressing my emotions because of the abuse that I experienced in my teenage years. All of my life, I have had trouble with self-esteem issues because I was bullied in school. It makes me really nervous and scared when people get angry and upset because of the abuse. So I try to ignore it when I feel that or try to hide it and put the brave face on and don't let anyone know that I'm hurting or angry because I don't want to rock the boat. Yeah, I can so very much relate to this. The, um, yeah, my, my dad was a very angry person, uh, all growing up and my instant response to that was freeze. Like my mind would go blank. My body would kind of go to liquid and, um, I just wouldn't be able to move or think. And it was, it was very terrifying. So, um, so yeah, I can still have those intense responses when someone gets really angry around me now. And uh, it's easy to be cool and collected and articulate when no one's angry, but you know, when someone really gets angry, then my mind goes blank. And, um, and it does, it does get better. Sometimes like I'm able to like remind myself of where I've been and where I'm at and and I'm able to kind of work through those trauma responses, but it still is the initial response. And um, it's funny because uh, that that's been an aspect of pickleball. So even though pickleball is like an amazing sport and uh, the the bar to entry is very low and anyone can, you know, start playing and really enjoying it. And there's a lot of room to grow and, you know, the the game becomes more exercise and more of a skill challenge the more skilled and fit you are. Um, the funny thing about it, though, is, is that, you know, people are beginning to play a sport again after many years of not playing any sports and kind of seeing themselves as retired athletes. And, um, and so some of those people are extremely competitive and some of them are, you know, have these really high unrealistic expectations of themselves and maybe some unhealed trauma responses themselves. So sometimes these old guys <laughs> start getting really angry with themselves uh, when they're playing and they're not playing as well as they want to. And, um, and so someone, you know, who's older than me, who is a male and getting really angry, you know, reminds me exactly of my dad. So, um, so yeah, so then it's just like, really, like I start playing poorly, that which makes them more angry, uh, because like I'm going into hypervigilance and having a panic attack and um, kind of freeze and fawn and all that stuff. So yeah, that's that's strangely kind of a regular thing um, at times, and so it's been a good practice for me to. Uh, or a, a good arena for me to practice. Um, how do I manage my own response to them? How do I let them be whatever they are, be in whatever emotional state they're in and not take that on myself, not feel like, oh, I need to do something to uh, make them feel better or soothe the situation or whatever. I'm they're they're responsible for them. I'm responsible for me. I'm gonna continue to enjoy the game. Um, hopefully they can follow my lead and kind of be easier on themselves too, but that's really up to them. And um so yeah, so it's it is always like a work in progress and I feel like the, there's a saying of, you know, if you get knocked off the horse, get in the saddle again. But 
you know, there's the extra element of trauma, like, you know, maybe <laughs> you were a kid in the circus and your, your circus act was to get knocked off the horse. And so like, um, you've been knocked off the horse over and over and over again, and you haven't actually had a good experience on a horse. So, um, so after coming from trauma, how do you actually interact in that situation, that same situation and believe for something different, something better? So, um, Janelle, uh, totally, totally relate and empathize with your struggle to express emotions, uh, because of the abuse that you experienced. And, um, and I know it's, it's easy to get nervous and angry uh, around angry people, nervous and scared around angry people. So, um, hopefully you are in a position where you can choose who you hang out, hang out with now, and you feel empowered to, um, decline invitations to people that don't feel safe and, uh, to reach out to people that, that feel safer and, um, that you can build a community of people that feel intentionally good for your well being. So, um, and, and then when you are exposed to those people that are angry, you can kind of move into an observer role, observe them having their tantrum, observe yourself being activated as a response, and then observe yourself kind of distancing yourself from what happened in the past, re reminding yourself that what happened in the past is not currently happening and that you are safer now, you're an adult now, you have more resources now and more wisdom and you're able to um, care for yourself no matter what anyone else is going through. So hopefully that's the case, but um, we witness you. Janelle, uh, we see you, we hear you. So thank you for sharing. And then Andrea says, when I'm feeling this way, unseen, unnoticed, I notice my body st uh, start to curl up and slouch, almost a natural way of protecting and hiding. Would like to strengthen my core to help remain upright through those feelings and not suppress them. And actually, that's a really, really beautiful and really brilliant observation because the physical body does respond to uh, what we are feeling. So the chemicals initiate a response in the muscles. So... Um, Let's see, I'm going to refresh because um, I have the, the group up here on my laptop as well. So I have, um, I've, I've talked about this TED Talk over and over, but um, I'm going to leave it in the comments. Let's see here. But this is uh, Amy Cuddy, and, um, and I think a lot of you have seen this, but it, I've, I've seen it so many times over many, many years, and um, it's absolutely brilliant. But the title of the TED Talk is, Your Body Language May Shape Who You Are. And as a researcher, uh, she and her team knew that uh, the body, like your posture responds to how you feel and it responds to the chemicals in your body. So someone who wins a sporting event is going to stand up straighter, throw the chest out, usually throw the arms up, throw the head up. And they, it's like, it's an automatic physiological response regardless of whether that has ever been seen before, because blind competitors do the exact same thing, just automatically. Uh, and then when someone is defeated, 
um, then their head lowers and their shoulders slouch and um, they kind of just kind of hang a little bit more limp and um, and that's also universal and and then animals kind of exhibit the same body language so what she and her team were interested in was is that process reversible can you put your body into a specific pose and then have that pose and posture influence your chemical levels and your hormones and your feelings and the answer is yes as little as two minutes of standing in a power pose will raise testosterone and lower cortisol. So, um, Andrea, what you're saying here, um, I notice my body start to curl up and slouch almost a natural way of protecting itself. And I would like to strengthen my core to help remain upright through these feelings and not suppress them. And that's absolutely brilliant. Um, and I, I do, uh, I, th I think ever since the Marines, when we had to stand at attention or march upright or uh, even sit at attention, <laughs> um, I've, I've been more in tune with my posture since then. And I, I do notice it's like some kind of alarm goes off when I'm slouching. And, and, I, and I, most of the time it is because of how I'm feeling, like I'm feeling defeated or low or sad or discouraged about something and then it affects my posture and then my body sends an alarm because that's not normal for me. So um, I'm thankful for that awareness, but I love this idea of intending to incorporate this into your exercise routine as a way of reminding your body uh, to hold fast, to stay strong, to know that it's safe, uh, to kind of project the energy of power and ability, which is not a lie. <laughs> um, you know, there's all, there's the, the whole subject of, um, truth telling. You know, is it true? <laughs> Are you telling lies? Are you fabricating things? And sometimes like when we're believing for something good to happen and there's no evidence of it, we can feel silly or like we're lying because we're not reporting accurately what we are witnessing. However, when we remember that we are creators, not just experience, experiencers of reality, then, um, then it's no longer a lie to tell a better story. We want to create something better, something different. So it makes sense for us to live in the feelings that we want to experience more of. And I do, I do believe that that is easier for people who have not experienced trauma, but, um, it's not impossible for people who have experienced trauma. And, and that's something that I'm, I'm realizing. Sometimes we may have to take baby steps in that because there is a, um, a mantra that I think is true and that I think is, is really wonderful and really ideal. And that is everything is working out for me. When you have experienced intense trauma and almost nothing in your life has ever worked out for you, <laughs> um, it, it could be like a big leap to all of a sudden start saying everything is working out for me. So maybe the baby step would be, uh, who knows, maybe something will work out. <laughs> 
So, so then you're kind of questioning, at, at least questioning your assumption of things not working out and you're open to the possibility of something working out. So that, I feel like that could be a really good approach for those of us who have experienced trauma and a whole bunch of negative things over and over and over and over again in life so that we have this massive library of experiential references of things not working out and then still be open to things working out and starting to build that collection of good things uh, that have gone well. So, um, so yeah, Andrea, thank you for your share and your thoughts. Um, I love the idea of, um, uh, doing core exercises to help you with your feelings and, um, yeah, just knowing that you are witnessed, you witness yourself. You have the strength and the courage to protect yourself and to be seen and to kind of live fully live large in the world. So yeah, that's a really, really wonderful thing. So thanks for sharing that. And thank you all for being a part of the conversation and for witnessing each other. Uh, if you have any comments, would love to hear them, uh, just post them below. And we'll talk to you soon. Have a great rest of the week. Love you.